Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. I'm, I'll be talking pretty fast. I've done this talk once or twice before. So this is all part of my day job, which is working for a company called CloudBees. Um, uh, we want to do a whole lot of stuff with uh, just using JavaScript and just in the web with our existing APIs. So this is sort of what I found out. Um, so the assumptions that I'm working on and, and that a lot of us are working with is that everything is built out of services these days and lots of microservices, lots of services that do one thing. They all have a public API and uh, JavaScript object notation, JSON is pretty much the default language. And then, uh, so given those assumptions, I often ask the question, well, why do we have these middleware servers, all these servers that are really just text pumps, they're just moving text from A to B? Uh, why not just bring all that integration into the browser itself? Like, for example, our case was we have, you know, an application hosting service, we have a whole lot of Git repositories and users use GitHub, that has a nice uh, public API. We have a continuous integration service called Jenkins, and once again, that has a has a uh, API that you can consume. We'd like to be able to mash them up into different web apps, you know, a console or a web app or a website. Uh, we don't want to have more servers in the mix. Uh, but the problem that we found is, you know, as you all know, if you try and go and uh, build a web app and you try and talk to five different uh, APIs, different endpoints, is you get the same origin policy, the single origin policy, which is great if it's a, if it's a, a scotch, but uh, it can be a bit of a pain. You can read all about that. Uh, I'm not going to harsh on the same origin policy because I think the web security model's actually been really good. It's got a pretty good track record. This is something that's probably, you guys probably know better than me, you know, it's deployed on maybe a billion devices around the world. And it's actually been pretty good exploit-wise. And you, you're shipping executable code to all these devices every day. That's, that's pretty amazing. So I'm not going to harsh on the origin policy. So how do we work around? Well, the first way is integration middleware. You have your, all your different servers. And then you have your, your web server that's serving up your app. And then you have its sort of proxy, you know, just almost a transparent proxy to all these other servers. But it's kind of overkill and it's just, it adds more latencies, there's more hops in the network. Uh, so JSONP comes along. So I'm sure everyone here has probably heard of JSONP, uh, if not used it. Um, that's JavaScript object notation with padding. So you take some pure JSON or some pure data and then you make it a function call and then evalid in the browser. So it's, it's a way to get around the uh, same origin policy because you're, you're basically telling the browser, load this resource, please. And that resource is actually a dynamic piece of data, but the browser doesn't know that. So I like to think, and as does uh, the guy after me, Danji, this is the most glorious hack ever. If there was a top five of, of elegant hacks, this is just wonderful and terrifying at the same time. So just this is a quick revision uh, before I jump into course. So bear JSON at the top and then uh, JSONP, you wrap a callback around it. So you turn it into a function call and that string is returned to the browser. Uh, it's obviously fine to do on the server side and you know, libraries on the client like jQuery or you could do it direct, uh, make it transparent. So if you're doing a direct Ajax call uh, in something like jQuery or, or direct, it looks something like that with JSONP cross domain. It's not really that different. You're still you're just saying the data type is JSONP, and you're specifying what the callback name is to use. Um, <clears throat> there's lots you can read about on JSONP on the web, and you can play around. I'm sure you've this audience is probably quite familiar with it. But what it's really doing uh, is creating script tags behind the scene and making your browser evaluate for every request each time each request. I don't like to think too hard about that. It's just amazing that it works, but it does. Uh, it kind of misses the spirit of same origin in the sense of the security. Uh, it has security holes, so any script you bring in this way, it's being evaled, and so it can pretty much have a, you know, a, a wider access to the internal workings of your JavaScript app in the browser, uh, maybe more than you would like. And also, and that also depends how how secure is the server serving up the JSONP? Is it you know, is it vulnerable to man in the middle attacks? It's, it's got its issues. Um, as other people smarter than me could probably say, JSON is not JavaScript. I'm not, I can't remember the exact relationship, subset or not. Uh, JSON can be safely read uh, without using an eval, uh, but JSONP, as far as I know, only works by basically evaling. Whatever it gets back, it's just gonna eval it. And you can only do get, which is a bit of a bummer in, in sort of a RESTful API world. So enter cause, so cross-origin resource sharing. So it's been around for a little while. Allows you uh, on the server side to specify who and what can access 
your endpoint and, and under what conditions and what headers and all that sort of stuff. And you can use, in that case, plain old data like JSON and all the HTTP verbs, put, delete, you know, the whole RESTful type of architecture. Uh, so now, now your diagram looks something like this. You've just got your, your, your single page app, for example, in the browser talking to a server, uh, the origin server, and then just pulling in whatever data, mashing it all up as it needs because there's this little header that says it's allowed to, to come in. So it's not these cores, not these lovely Irish lasses and their brother that says, oh, they're, they're my sisters you're looking at. It's not that. <clears throat> so it's trivial to consume. Uh, they're just plain old web calls, uh, direct from you know, any type of JavaScript you like. Uh, the only little gotchas that I came across was on the server and config side. The browser sort is, uh, support is fairly complete. Enable-cores.org can tell you all about that. And as I mentioned, all the HTTP verbs, put, uh, post, get, and all that, they're all supported, which is great. So this is how it looks on the client side. It's, once again, it's just a plain old call as if it's to the origin. I've put this little XHR fields here, just if someone sees that, then it might save them a day. I do a lot of sort of single sign-on apps where we have a single sign-on server, sometimes OAuth, often OpenID, and I probably spend a day scratching my head of why isn't it passing the credentials you know, the cookies and whatnot that I've got from that service, why isn't it passing it to my cause enabled endpoint? It's because I needed to, to turn that on. Uh, so how did this actually work under the covers, um, just so it doesn't sound so mysterious? Well, there's something called pre-flight checks that go on between the browser and the, the, the endpoint that you're trying to call. First time you go to call it, there's this little handshake called pre-flight checks. So the browser passes an origin header to the server uh, saying, I am this website and the server responds saying, I'm gonna allow uh, cross-origin requests from you know, this website, or it mightn't return anything. And in a sort of a, I guess there's a sequence diagram for those who haven't seen one before. The, uh, the first line is the browser does a HTTP options request. Uh, it's important to note that because some people, uh, if you're setting up server infrastructure, options is a, an unusual verb to use, but that's what the browsers use. Uh, and then, Back from the server, it says, sends back a few headers like access control allow, this and that and the other. And that's called pre-flight checks. And that happens once, and then after that, you're just doing direct calls, get, post, whatever you want, straight from the browser, as if you were served up from that other API endpoint. They're performed by the browser, opaque to the client app. Uh, the browser enforces, and you don't really see them. It depends on the browser how much they hide it. Uh, and it uses the option verb. I just mentioned that again. So sometimes this looks to me a bit like security theatre. It's a bit like the, the, the TSA. They're giving you a bit of a feel up, a bit of a grope, and a bit of a scan, and take your belt off and shoes. But does it really add any security? It can be an annoyance, and a lot of people actually will set it to, you know, they'll pass back a header from their API, their server that they want people to mash up into web apps. They'll say, access control our origin star. That's mostly fine, but it does, uh, you've got to think about what that means. That means anyone, any other website that's vulnerable to a script injection attack uh, or, or, or any, any third party website could have some JavaScript calls that are, that are fetching data from your website. And if, if that's passing security credentials with it, they could be getting, you could be leaking data that you might not intend to leak. The most common pattern that I've seen and that I've used is to return a header uh, it, from that endpoint that says access control allow origin and then whatever the URL that came in, you sort of echo it back out. Not the URL, actually, the host and the port. But you check it off a whitelist. So you go, here's all the websites, all the website patterns that I want to check it off against. Or, or the, these are all the people out in the world I want to allow to, to use my API. The spec says that you should be able to have a list of URLs or, or host names and ports. Um, but as with a lot of things, browser implementers read the first paragraph of the spec and they go, cool, and they go and implement that, and then they don't come back and read the rest. So this is a bit of a problem. This is a real bummer, because that means you can't do this as like a dynamic, uh, sorry, a, a static config in Nginx or Apache or something like that. You've actually got to have a little bit of server code doing there, uh, doing this logic, which is, it's not too bad. But. So in terms of the, the servers that you guys might be using, uh, Ruby's pretty pop popular, so there's a rack cause uh, library. You just include that. It's not that hard to do if it's a Java. If it's a Java uh, app, then you just, uh, you're basically using a servlet filter to intercept things. If it's Node, then you can use Express middleware. It's not hard, but it, 
you know, it's a little bit more work than it should be. Uh, so some other headers that are involved in this little cause dance, this handshake pre-flight check. Uh, there's what headers you want to flow backwards and forwards. By default, it won't send any headers, but you can specify what ones you want to come back. Uh, what methods are allowed, I usually put them all. Um, and then if you want to allow credentials uh, as well. So if you're using OpenID, you want to turn that on. Authorization, uh, you can use per request tokens, OAuth, OpenID, all that sort of stuff works. If you set it up right, the cookies and everything will flow along, it works beautifully. Uh, it is your app's responsibility to do all authorization and identity. The browser pre-flight checks are at sort of a level below, so you can't rely on them for anything really. Uh, debugging can be a pain with Chrome. The version as of uh, uh, quite recently, uh, it wouldn't show you those pre-flight requests, so you just get, things would just fail and you get really frustrated and go back to JSONP. But if you look at the Chrome net internals events, or if you use Firefox, you can actually see them. Uh, and I'll show a screen cap of this. It looks a bit terrifying, but it's not that bad. It's actually quite interesting. So here's a screen capture. I've searched for the URL of the endpoint that's not working. I, I zoom in on it here, and I can check at the top I've got my request headers going out, and at the bottom I've got the response headers coming back. So I'm making sure the origin that goes out matches up with the access control allow origin coming back in. So there's a little bit of an art to that, but they are getting better with the tools. Uh, if you see those sorts of things uh, in, the, in the log, that means you know, the, the, the handshake, the, the pre-flight checks aren't working uh, for, for whatever reason. My minimal setup is to allow you know, all the verbs I care about get put post-delete, uh, uh, allow credentials, and then have a white list of what <coughs> websites I'm going to allow. And that's really all I do, and that's, that's been working great so far. You've got to include the ports in that uh, header that you pass back. If you're using uh, Node.js uh, with Express, you can use this uh, sort of, I guess you'd call it a middleware to intercept things and add those headers as needed. Uh, similarly for Rack and Ruby, uh, there's a link at the bottom for, with instructions on how to set that up. If you want to find anything more about Cause, Enable Cause is a great, uh, great resource website. They're sort of, they're taking on the role of advocating it to say, you know, try and do things this way, it's more secure, it's, it's better, you know, get away from JSONP. Uh, for me, it's not so much about security, I just think it's great that you can build these, these apps, single page apps, or whatever you want to call it. And there's so many APIs, APIs out there, you can mash things together, do it really quickly, and you don't have to have more server infrastructure. And as someone whose day job involves managing a, a fleet of a large number of servers, less servers is good, because they're a hassle. So that's it. Thanks, everyone, and I've got a few minutes to spare. I think we're pretty much on to the next.